at the Kitchen Studios. This is the Pencil Pushers Podcast. Welcome, folks. This is yet another power-packed episode of the Pencil Pushers Podcast, and I'm your humble host, Mike Rosado. Today, we talk to Brent Engstrom, a super talented illustrator who spent the better part of the past 15 years working for the Topps Company, drawing some of the most beautifully disgusting and hilarious cast of characters with the iconic Garbage Pail Kids, Wacky Packages, Mars Attacks, and more. Brent talks about how his life came full circle from being a massive fan of the collectibles as a kid to now being part of the small ragtag team of artists that get to make a living living out their childhood dreams. So let's dive right in, folks. Grab yourself a cold one, sit back, relax, and enjoy our chat with Brett. All right, we are here with Brent Engstrom. I am super thrilled to have you here, man. To give some context, basically this journey started about 60 days ago of discovering who you were. I was doing some research on wacky packages for an Instagram post I was doing for the holidays. So I was like trying to find information, you know, like go back in time and try and find some really cool inspiration. And I came across your website and I was just like, okay, I'm finding a little bit of the holy grail here. Who is this new guy who's back on the scene? And I was just thrilled to like just do a rabbit hole dive to find out about your artwork. And awesome to find out that you're you're pretty much like one of the the, the new generation garbage pail kid wacky packages artist now, right? I mean, essentially. Yeah, it's turned into that over the years. <laughs> it's led into me almost doing it every day at this point. Yeah, it seems at this point the the prolific amount of work that you're cranking out. I can't imagine you have much of a. Uh, a normal life. I mean, are you pretty much buried in your artwork uh, constantly at this point? Um, kinda, yeah. I mean, I, I usually work at night, so I just will work throughout the night. It's like the easiest time for me to find a giant block of time to finish a painting if I need to. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I, How many paintings are you usually cranking through in uh, in a day? I mean, one a day would be what I would want to do, but every once in a while, it's it can be more than that <laughs> if I'm meeting some crazy yeah. deadline. I don't yeah, know. yeah. So, so tell me how this journey started, man. I mean, um, just to kind of catch people up and just to let you know, this is a podcast that talks about all spectrums of the hand-drawn art. So there's people from all different mediums listening in. So talk a little bit about how you got into working for Tops and Garbage Pail Kids in particular. Yeah, I, uh, I wasn't doing any artwork, really. I was just working in like a used bookstore at the time. And I started getting getting these like illustration like spot illustration jobs through with like magazines and stuff yeah that's what made me think i could maybe make a living at it because it was like i'd make more off of a magazine cover or something than i would weeks at working at the store so it was like, <laughs> ended up moving into my uh, brother's house living in his basement to kind of save where money. is this at by the way uh, it was in a town called Salina, Kansas. I moved back from the town I was okay. living in and just lived down there and just submitted my work to as many companies as I could. And I was just drawing <laughs> in his house, trying to see if anything stuck. And then um, a friend of mine, he's a comic book artist and he was at a convention. He met Jeff Zapata. He was the editor at the time of talk like garbage yeah. pill kids and wacky packages he thought i would be into that i, I had never really talked about garbage pill kids but he was like i think you'd be good at this and then i uh wrote jeff zapata just kind of kind of thinking it'd be another job that just said no and then he right. was like yeah i'll give you a shot i just showed him some old paintings i had done they weren't even garbage pill kid related it was just kind of showing that i kind of could grasp the painting <laughs> and he did sure. and he gave me like a trial painting of like uh just the concept that he sent and then i ended up getting the job through that and then i got a wacky shortly after that and it was just kind of built now, up but you that. were you were actually a big fan growing up when you were a kid yeah uh, and your buddy who had referred you to uh zapata had no idea right uh no he didn't really know because i was a fan as a kid and then i knew they had come back but i was i just thought they were kind of above my skill level because i hadn't really painted anything professionally really i was mostly yeah. drawing at comic books and or trying to get comic books published and stuff but painting was always something i did on the side i painted a lot through college and stuff so it was like something that i 
did a lot, but I never felt fully confident in it. And I kind of, once I got out of college, I kind of scrapped everything I had learned and kind of adjusted it to how I want to paint. Like I just kind of mm-hmm. changed stuff and it mm-hmm. works better the way I, I mean, I paint kind of a weird way, I guess, to speed it up. So you were clearly into comic book art. Was that sort of the trajectory you were hoping for when you're growing up that maybe I could be a comic book artist or even a writer slash artist or what was the deal? Yeah, I, uh, first it was comic book artist and then the writer artist thing popped in later when I realized I didn't really know how it was set up back then. Like I didn't know that. I just thought, assumed they all wrote it and drew, I don't know what I thought. But <laughs> then, when, then when Image Image Comics came out, I realized. Like a lot of those guys were writing and drawing their comics. Yeah. And I was right. like, I was like in junior high and I was like, start from the groundwork of all these new comics. So I really got into this one called The Savage Dragon. I just kept reading that. And then I would write Eric Larson, the creator of that. And then finally he let me do like a backup story in, in his comic. And, he, and I used my characters. And like, and I was doing really? it. I was doing a comic strip all through college. Yeah, it was Monkey Boy, right? Yeah, yeah, Monkey I did Boy, a right. Daily Monkey Boy comic strip. And then uh, I wrote Eric Larson, and I'd always just kind of pester him. And then he finally let finally let me do this. It was a two issue. After college, or yeah, right after I graduated, I was just like, I'm going to start a plan all over. But then that was my first published work, and it was like wow. kind of like a dream job. So I was like, what do I do from here? <laughs> Cause it was like, my, <laughs> He's like, I've done it all. It was my favorite comic and he ended up coloring it. It was like one of his first times he ever colored a comic. So he colored it and like, I don't know. It was, it was pretty cool. And then I, <laughs> and then I was like, just trying to submit my work everywhere, like Fanagraphics and, and all these other companies and stuff. Yeah. And it just never, I just would get rejection letters. So when I submitted the tops, I just kind of thought it was just a shot in the dark. And this is like what you were mid mid to late twenties when when yeah, you finally got to that point. Yeah, twenty five or so. But the Savage Dragon stuff was earlier. There was kind of a break where I just I don't know. I just wasn't. Nothing was really happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Were your parents uh, into you uh, 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 getting deep into comic book art, or were they trying to like you know get a job? Real like get. Uh, like, there's always you need to get a job when you're not making any money on it. <laughs> sure. So it's like, so that was always the thing. You need to get a real job, but like, I slowly started making a living on it. So I, yeah, are they still saying that to you? Uh, <laughs> if I could try to tell them, I. They're proud of me and everything. They think it, they think it's cool, and they always I always drew when I was a kid, so it was like they're fine with it, and they were always supportive yeah. of me drawing all the time. It wasn't. Yeah, it's it's interesting with garbage pail kids because. You know, as I was doing that sort of rabbit hole discovery or rediscovery of wacky packages and garbage pail kids, it, there was this real like um, almost hard to describe visceral feeling that I had. It almost took me back to when I was like 10 years old, 11 years old. Now, I'm assuming you had that same sort of feeling as well. Like what what are your... What are your th- what were your thoughts about Garbage Pail Kids when you were a kid? I mean, I'm assu- you were drawing at that point too, right? You started drawing pretty early. Yeah, I started drawing when I before I could remember really. Like me, I have a twin brother, and we would, and I have an older brother, and we would all just sit around drawing. This is before the internet, so you would have to yeah. entertain what yourself. Else you yeah. yeah, so we would just, I don't know, I would draw all day, and yeah. we would just kind of look at each other's drawings and bounce ideas and stuff off of each other, but. Then later in high school, they had kind of gone on to other things at that point, and I was still reading comics and drawing all through. And that was always just my only goal in life, was to draw mm-hmm. comics. <laughs> mm-hmm. And by that time, you had already pretty much forgotten about Garbage Pail Kids, um, right? I hadn't forgotten about them, but it wasn't like something... I just... At that time, I didn't think they would come back. Like, I, there was just something yeah. that I liked when I was a kid, and had very fond memories of them. I, I don't know, I like Ren and Stimpy and gross out stuff from the 80s. Yeah, Beavis and Butthead, right? Yeah, like even, yeah, clear into the 90s, I always liked that stuff. Even in high school, I liked Beavis and Butthead and stuff. So it was like, <laughs> it was something that was always kind of on, in the back of my mind. And then they, when the new set came out in the early 2000s, they would advertise in comic books. They would have like a page with some of the, and you could, I think they even had cards in there you could, tear out 
that's when I started as an adult thinking maybe I would want to do this, but I still thought they were like they were done too well. I didn't like think I was capable mm-hmm. or something <laughs> until right, I started right. doing them, and then uh, I found out I could do them sort of. <laughs> so what what exactly happened? Um, I mean, because what I remember was you know it was essentially in the '80s when Garbage Pail Kids was really popular. And then as I grew up, I just sort of forgot all about them. And like I was showing you before, I still have my old collection with me. But they were basically like, you know, things that hung out in the attic. And sometimes I'd go back and find them and, you know, laugh a little bit. But then they'd get tucked back in there. Um, What happened to Garbage Pail Kids outside, you know, and, and then how did it have this kind of resurgence? I mean, I know there was an issue with cabbage patch the cabbage patch kids and they got sued and all that kind of stuff but that was different though right yeah there was that lawsuit but they still they just kind of changed the look of them and uh yeah kept going through the 80s i mean it, it only was like 85 to 88 i think where they put, <laughs> pumped out like 15 sets so they were putting out a lot of sets yeah. during that time but then I don't know. I guess maybe it must have just dropped off a little bit to where they weren't making as much money. I'm not sure why it quit actually, because they were making tons of they were making tons of profit back then. I know that, so it yeah. just they just must have moved on. Just didn't think it was worth it or something. Do you, Do you have any idea what the instigation was to bring it back eventually? Um, I think a lot of it was Jeff Zapata, like kind of looking around at their old, like ugly stickers and wacky packages and thinking that they own those products so like they own those brands so they might as well make new ones but that was before i started so i'm not sure what what kicked it all back off but i think it had a lot to do with jeff zapata yeah nice and he He has a big love for all that stuff mars attacks and all that now do you still work with him is he still part of the brand or he he does stuff for them still like they just put out a garbage pill kit um book written by Mm R.L. Stein and he he drew the interior artwork for that oh wow that's cool yeah so that's pretty neat that he's he is still doing he still really likes them and stuff (laughs) none of the old school dudes from the 80s are still working on them right Tom Bunk does oh really he was out of it for a while because he was doing a bunch of stuff for Mad Magazine and then they I think he still does stuff for Mad because they still have some new art in there yeah but he is going to be in some of the next sets I think Gotcha. But John Pound, I think, is retired. Right, right. Yeah, he's he's the king, pretty much, right? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wish he would do some more, but he's out of, out of sight. I was actually watching um, 30 Years of Garbage, the documentary on Garbage Pail Kids, and it seems like he he definitely seems to look back with very, very fond memories I don't feel like it doesn't get he doesn't give me the impression in the documentary that he's kind of like, yeah, yeah, I did that to, you know, pay the bills. I mean, it seemed like he really got a lot of enjoyment out of it. Do you get to talk to him much? Uh, No, I've I've never talked to him. So John Pound, just for those listening, he is basically from what I've discovered largely through the documentary. So great job. I guess basically Pound was the main guy. He was kind of the Captain America that brought that whole team up to speed of where the level of artistry and grotesqueness uh, (laughs) needed to be. I mean, is is that how you would assess it as well? Yeah, I think there's there's kind of a controversy if it was Art Spiegelman, Mark Newgarden. I mean, there was a group of people that thought of it, conceived the idea. And then, I mean, John Pound's the one who brought it. The art guy. Yeah, he was like the Jack Kirby of yeah, garbage yeah. pill kids. <laughs> he made it what, what it is. Like right. I think I don't know without John Pound if it would have. I think having one person do the first couple sets really yeah. like solidified it. Then when Tom Bunk came, he brought his own style to it, and I think it. I think he was great. Yeah. Too. So, um, <laughs> did John Pound do all of the cards for for the first two series? I think he was saying he okay. would paint like one a day back then just to keep the sets coming out. But it, um, Tom Bunk yeah. did the backs, of the, the artwork on the backs. It was more like comic book style, kind of comic strips and stuff okay. on the backs. And then the third series he came in and painted. And so with, with Garbage Pail Kids being such a huge national phenomenon back in the 80s, how do you see it changed now? You know, obviously the, the level of artistry is essentially just as good. Where do you see it 
different or similar in terms of the sort of public response? It's just kind of a different animal at this point because when I was a kid, I would just go into a gas station and buy a pack. Like, I, I do see them at gas stations every once in a while still, but it's not like it's the craze it was where they were in every store yeah. and selling out. And But they do really well in like Targets and stuff. But it's, yeah. that that's kind of different just how it's marketed. But being online, you can just buy them online too. So I'm sure that opened a whole nother avenue for, yeah. <laughs> for profit. Yeah. But all, they are, we, I stick to old school airbrushing and it's all hand done still. So art-wise, it's done the same way. <laughs> I yeah. just don't have to mail the paintings in anymore. I just send them a file. And when I first started, I was mailing the paintings in. They photograph them and... Let's actually talk a little bit about process. So I, I was reading that you initially, when you first started working with Tops, that you were largely maybe pen and ink, but you were doing a lot of the stuff uh, digitally in terms of coloring. But now you are strictly acrylic, and I've seen you answer on Instagram like people, "What what uh, what digital program are you using?" Like it's acrylic, <laughs> dude. <laughs> this is about uh, the only thing I respond to. Just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm interested to hear about your process. Um, can you walk me through? Firstly, what does a day in the life look like for an artist uh, working for Garbage Pail Kids? Like what what? You wake up, do you get calls from an art director who tells you what you're what you need to be working on for the week or how does that all work? Some sometimes there are um, sets that just pop up that relate to news stories and stuff that are sold online. So they're real topical. So sometimes I will get up and get like a message saying, We need this done in a day or two. Most recent one was the GameStop stuff the stock right. market, game stuff. <laughs> there was like a thing with that, so we did some some of those, but those are the ones that are really rushed, but usually I have like a block of time where I know I need to paint. Like I'm working on the next set right now and it's, so I just work it in each day until the set comes out pretty much. It's, what is the set? It's about 30 paintings usually, but it can be more than that or less sometimes, but wow. 35. The last set I did, I think 38 or something like that. It was a lot of painting. But when I first started, I painted them by hand. And then there was a, it was called the All New Series. And I, there was, I did a couple of sets like that. And then there was one where they asked me to maybe try to do it digitally, the paintings digitally. So I did do a whole set digital. Just oh, wow. painted, painted them in Photoshop. But it, it kind of helped set up some of the process, like, the airbrush backgrounds and stuff were a lot easier and but it was just mm -hmm. I have a hard time staring at a computer screen that long like it was really starting to affect my eyes I think so I was glad to go back to traditional painting yeah it's still, I mean it still kind of hurts my eyes but. but in a different kind of way right now is the is the art director guiding you with the name and the concept all the time I know that's you said that specific occasions that happens, but are you how how involved are you in conceptualizing names, concepts, that type of thing? There was a point where we I would just submit the concept and the painting, and then they would name them all at the end. Like I didn't have any say in the name, but now I write I just write a couple of names on the concept sketch, and then we can I can talk to the other artist so we don't du duplicate names, and so it, it kind of works out better if we're naming them. A lot of people think the name comes first, but it never does for me. So back in the 80s, it, I, it seemed to be the impression was is that you had Spiegelman and uh, Mark Newgarden. Mm -hmm. They were seeming to be kind of like the gag guys, right? Yeah. So it was a little bit more traditional in that sense where you had like art directors who were yeah. telling the artist what to do. So it's a little bit different now. When I first started, I was doing a lot of uh, Jay Lynch. He did a lot of the old wacky package gags and stuff, but I was I was doing his concepts when I first started. And then after a couple sets, I started submitting my own gags. And then every once in a while, I will do other people's concepts. Like a lot of times the wacky packages, I they, people still submit concepts. They have they have gag writers for that still. But with Garbage Ball mm -hmm. Kids, I, I usually write all my own gags. Yeah. It's interesting. So the, the process for you, it's kind of, it's much different when back, 
you know, when you were in your 20s, you were doing comic strips, you know, comic book, you know, ideas, which are going to be long form concepts, right? And now what you've got to do is you've got to take a whole concept and wrap it into one panel, essentially. Uh, Must be a completely different. Yeah, I kind of do look at them each as like a one panel gag comic strip, kind of like a Adam, like a Charles Adams comic strip or something where it has to all make sense in one. But sometimes the name can push it forward. Like if the gag's kind of hard to read, you can tell what it is by the... But I try to make it to where you wouldn't even need the name to make it work. But, but right. some of the, like, like the game stops, I don't know if it's something that specific, it's kind of hard to, like, to not make it rely on the name. I would rather, I don't know, I want it to be more open to where yeah. you can just be a kid throwing up and you just get the guy. Yeah. What do you do when you can't come up with ideas? Do you, do you connect with other GPK artists? Do you go back in the vintage vault? I, I do have a lot of concepts that I've submitted that were rejected over the years. So I sometimes will just go through and grab one and resubmit it. And it, and it yeah. will get, sometimes it'll get approved, sometimes it won't. <laughs> but it, right. but it, a lot of times I, I'll be think, trying to think of a gag all day and then I'll lay down to go to sleep and then I'll just have a flood of ideas. That's usually when I, I'll think of like half of a set as I'm falling asleep sometimes. And then I just, write them all down on my phone like do you just do that do you do that before you go to sleep essentially or do you ever wake up in the middle of the night and just go straight to the drawing board and get a concept down um i i'll usually write and just write the idea down or else i would really forget i have gotten up to like use the restroom and i'll think of something and then i'll write it down and then go back to sleep right i i don't think i've ever gotten up and like drawn something <laughs> yeah but I, have, I do write down a lot of ideas because your brain is kind of working at a different level at that point. Totally. Because I'll have some real weird ideas pop into my yeah. head yeah. as I'm going to sleep. When you're, when you're diving into a, a set that you, need to, that you need to build out, is it just a lot of sketching? And then when you get to the point of where you feel like you've got something that's pretty solid in terms of concept... Now you paint on a five by seven, uh, approximately five by seven. Is that still the case? I think I read something about that, right? Yeah. And you spray paint the background, which is pretty. I guess this is that's that's what John Pound would do, right? He would spray paint the background. Yeah, with an airbrush, with like a right. Paint. I'll do airbrush effects if it needs like. Sometimes you have to do it over the painting if it needs like smoke in front of something or stink lines or anything. Like, right. So that sometimes you do have to use the airbrush after the fact, but usually I just mask it off and airbrush it, and then, and then take that off and paint. Were you familiar with uh, spray painting before you? Because it looked like your older stuff, it didn't really have spray paint that much attributed to the artwork. Like, how did you learn how to get into that? I did a little bit in uh, high school. Like, I, my art teacher kind of saw that I was into art so he would let me he would let me do some of the stuff outside of the rest of the class like he showed me how to airbrush and stuff so that I guess I learned it then but I but I didn't use it for eight years or something and then I uh once I I just bought an airbrush off eBay or something and then I have been using that same one ever since but it it was a big (laughs) learning curve sort of because it was always really stressful to like because it would jam up and there would splatter sure. paint something. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with an airbrush. So now I've kind of gotten the handle of it. If I do mess up, I just I can usually fix it. Or it's rare that I have to start over. Yeah, clearly you've mastered it, man. It's uh, the the work is just super beautiful. It's actually really cool to go back and like look at your old stuff from like ten years ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've painted a lot of garbage ball kids in that <laughs> time. Are you still passionately in love with it as you were 10 years ago? Or do you see yourself stretching into other parts from a career perspective? Where are you at with that? I, I really do still like it. I, cause each one is different enough. Like they're not like, they're not easy. So it's like yeah, each yeah. one's like a little puzzle to solve usually. And it's, they're fun. Like I, like I can't complain with the joy I get out of it. But I do yeah. have like a, I do have comic books that I still want to uh, make. Like I have a lot of stuff, ideas for comics and stuff that I maybe 
down the road. I'm not sure when, but yeah, what is it? I found this guy's diary and his when when I was working at the bookstore, it came in a box of books, like a guy's diary. And it was like a five year diary where he wrote every day in it, and I've just been translating that into a comic. Really. <laughs> But I'm like a year into it. But I have it all kind of laid out, ready to work on whenever I have time. But it's is it is the story like uh, intriguing or is it just? I, I think it is. It's kind of. I mean, it's a daily diary, so it's kind of mundane and right. It was from like the early '80s to on, so it's like as a little time capsule of the '80s of a wow of a man. <laughs> <laughs> One day this guy's going to be like walking into a comic book shop and be like, this looks exactly like my life back in the 80s. <laughs> I, think he's pa- I think he's passed away. I think he's no, passed oh, really? I think, yeah. I think he. So I don't know. I, I've changed the names and everything. So I hope, hopefully I can do that at some point. But yeah, it's, I'm pretty deep into that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, cool, man. Why don't you um, tell the listeners where they can uh, find uh, your work? I mostly just post on Instagram at this point, Brent A. Inkstrom on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> but so you're not on that website anymore? Um, I had like an old blog, and I just haven't updated that in a long time. I have a, I have a Tumblr that I guess I do update that, but it's I don't know who's going to a Tumblr. It, <laughs> Instagram's my main thing. I post daily, I guess. So that would be where you would be able to keep up on what I'm doing mostly, but. Yeah, I would definitely suggest going to that, um, to your Instagram, but they should also check out monkeyboycomic.blogspot.com. There's something about having it in that format where you've got the black background just to really have the pieces of art just like popping off the page. I mean, it's really beautiful stuff. Yeah, thanks. (laughs) Yeah, I I want to update that. I just, the time to update a bunch of websites is kind of... (laughs) I didn't even ask you about uh, much about wacky packages. Is that something you really dig into uh, much as well? Yeah, I, th- those were some. Uh, those were harder to find when I was a kid. I think I saw them once in a gas station. I bought a couple packs, and those are the only ones I had. Right. But I they actually stayed with me a lot because I stuck some on my headboard of my bed. They were always something that was in my mind. But then when I start like those for something I thought I'd never work on, and then that I'm doing them. So. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, sounds like a dream job, man. Yeah, I, I, I love it. But <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, cool, man. Well, Brent, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thanks for taking the time and your crazy busy schedule. Yeah, and, for sure. Um, we will talk soon. All right, my man. It's fun. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Pencil Pushers podcast. Follow us on Instagram at the Pencil Pushers podcast for visual representation of our guest artwork, topics discussed, and anything else that contributes to the show. So be sure to subscribe, tell a friend, tell lots and lots of friends, become a leadhead, and we're out.